So it was like I was expecting the noise to continue, and it was just like the song stopped and everybody got quiet. And I'm like, okay. And we heard the bell. So good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. It is good to see you all. It means at least either your clocks or you turned, jumped ahead. 
It's like I don't touch my phone, it knows what it's doing, everything else is up for grabs. <laughs> um, as we have been doing during this season of Lent, we begin with a call to worship, so I invite you to join me. On our worst days, God is good. On our best days, God is good. When life is consistent, God is good. When, and when life turns on its head, God is good. Day and night, Monday through Sunday, God is good. God is here. God is love. Hold tight to that good news. Let us worship our God. Just some announcements as we begin today. First of all, thank you for welcoming Pastor Bjornby last week. I thank you very much for extending your always warm welcome when folks visit. Um, also, have you noticed something growing throughout this Lenten season? As you've seen throughout these, our, our theme is wandering heart, wandering a pathway. Each of the symbols that are there are part of them that are connected. It's kind of what you saw in that first video. But they reflect each of our themes each week. As we take this journey with Paul through the Gospels and we end up at the cross and resurrection, it will continue to grow throughout the Lenten season and even into the first couple weeks of our Easter season. As we reflect on what faith is and how God works in our lives in the challenges as well as in the exciting times to help us wander and find new places but keeps us on the right path. So I invite you to keep your eyes out on what's there because different things will be appearing throughout the season including um, something that will be incorporated into our Good Friday and Monday Thursday services. Um, so I just kind of put that in your head if you're like wondering why things are appearing on the wall. It's not just because we had nothing better to do. It does have a purpose. Let's see. I'm looking at my little notes that I had here. Thanks for that. Did that. Um, our Lenten programming continues on Wednesday evenings. Um, look forward to seeing you as we look at laments and look at um, how we see Jesus in the Psalms. And we eat together. Then I have, if I could ask someone, a couple people to help me out, there are kitchen items in the back of my car. If I could have a couple people just take them from my trunk and take them down into the kitchen, I would really appreciate that because trying to take them down one by one, I'll be here for hours. Um, so if just a couple people could pick up an arm load and take stuff down, I would appreciate it. Okay, I'm out of things I made on my list for not knowing what's going on here. Um, are there things, though, that you would like to? Pat? Pat? Thanks. For our recording, we're, we're having streaming issues, but we're still recording this so I can press it. Um, sign up for Easter brunch. If you're going to be here and would like to help and bring stuff, um, give Patricia Rabb a call and she'll get you on the list if you're not going to swing by the building um, to sign up. So those of you who will join us online and want to join us on Easter, please come be part of Easter brunch. Yes, Jeff. Council at 6 on Thursday, downstairs in the fellowship hall. With that, I invite you to take just a few moments and to prepare your hearts for worship.
I would invite you to stand as you are able and join me in the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Amen. There's a moment in today's scripture to, when Jesus turns to Peter, named the rock of the church, and says, get behind me, Satan. I don't know about you all, but that's a pretty bad day for Peter. It's a pretty bad day when Jesus calls you Satan. Fortunately, this absurd moment comforts me with the knowledge that even Peter made mistakes. Peter, who was given the keys to heaven. Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, made mistakes just like me, just like you. And still Jesus chose him. Knowing that, let us speak honestly with God. For even now on our worst days, we belong to God. And that will never change. Join me in prayer. Holy God, we often find ourselves moving through a world that does not make sense. Like Peter, we want to yell out, this should not happen. We want to control scenarios beyond our reach. We want to hold your world in our hands. Forgive us for the moments when we lead with declarations instead of curiosity. Forgive us for arguing when we could listen. Forgive us for fixating on one truth when we could open ourselves up to many. Soften our hard edges and teach us how to listen. With hope in our hearts we pray. Amen. Friends, no matter how many times you have dug in your heels, no matter how many fights you have wanted to pick with God, no matter how many times you have disagreed, raged, or clung to what you know instead of embracing holy change, we worship a God of grace. Nothing can separate us from God's love, not even a stubborn attitude or a tense heart. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. God's love for you will always be deeper than we can imagine. You are seen. You are loved. You are forgiven. Now follow Peter and go be the church in the world. Amen. We open singing together the song, Ask the Complicated Questions. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We continue to use as our Kyrie, have mercy on us, Lord.
Let us pray. Listening God, if we could attach ourselves to you, we would. We would scribble your scripture onto our tender hearts. We would weave your good news into the fiber of our being. We would bind ourselves to you, but instead we wander. Instead of attaching ourselves to you, we find ourselves swept up in the busyness of life. Like a seesaw of faithfulness, we move back and forth, up and down, constantly trying to find you in the midst of it all. So speak clearly to us now. Quiet the distractions long enough for us to affix ourselves to your good news. We are listening. We are hungry. We are hopeful. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Good morning. Good morning. And our first reading today is from Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon the pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 107, <laughs> verses 1 to 3 and 17 to 22. We read it responsively. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, for God's mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the head of the foe, gathering them from the land, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took rebellious paths. Through their sins they were afflicted. They loathed all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then in their trouble they cried out to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You sent forth your word and healed them, and rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, and tell of your deeds with shouts. According to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Not bad. From that time on, meaning following Peter's confession, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, 
God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. When your world unravels and your beliefs are tested, you may cling to what you know. As Jesus foretells his death and resurrection, Peter protests. Peter is fixed upon the way he thinks things should go. He resists the pain of what will come. But Jesus is fixed upon his calling and calls Peter out. For everyone, there comes a time when your faith is tested and you will have to face difficult and inconvenient truths. We may want to take the easier path, the path with less pain. We may want to cling to easy or simplistic answers. Instead, what does it look like to welcome complexity? Can you stay fixed upon your convictions while also expanding your perspective. That reflection was written by one of the contributors to this Wandering Heart series that we've been working on throughout this Lenten season. And as I was looking through the materials what seems like months ago, trying to decide what was kind of speaking to me for Lent, it was this opening reflection on this text that caught my attention. And kind of got me into, let's look at this wandering story of Peter as we think about our own Lytton journey. Little did I know back then that these would be very personal questions for me and for my faith. So what do you think? Can you stay fixed upon your convictions while also expanding your perspective? And related to that is, how do you know when it's time to change your conviction? Because your perspective has become so greatly expanded. Our faith lights, like the rest of our lives, evolve throughout time as we have new experiences and learn things and test out what we believe and have others test out against us what we believe and all of that. And we try to figure it out. And then you start having kids, or you teach kids, and they ask questions you never even thought of asking. Like one I heard about while I was driving the other day. It was from a five-year-old, um, I don't remember if it was a little boy or a little girl, but a five-year-old in the Philippines, who asked his mom, well, why did Jesus go to Israel and not the Philippines? You know? I've never had anybody ask me why Jesus didn't appear in the Philippines. Would have never even thought about that. Ah, yes. Can we live with the complexities of life? Or is there only one right answer that we must figure out and then defend to the death? Our texts today help us struggle with these questions. As we get to see glimpses of faith not only in Peter, but also those wilderness wanderers. Now, those wilderness wanderers, if they've hung in this long by where we are in numbers, they have most likely given up the simple answers a long time ago. Oh, we're free! Oh, but we have no place to live now. Oh, but we're free! We have nothing to eat. We're free! But so many people had to die so that we could be free. Oh, we're free and God loves us, but yet there are these snakes that are biting and killing us? How could that be? Oh, we're free? Was it really all worth it? What these months and eventual years of wandering tells us about how we see God and what we believe. 
It's no wonder that they complained often and loudly throughout their wilderness journey. It's difficult trying to figure out this stuff and live into a whole new reality, trying to figure out how your theology that you had when you were a slave and the stories you've heard from your ancestors now fit into you wandering around and you don't know where God is and everything seems wrong, all while you're still trying to stay alive. When your picture of God is too small or too simplistic, it's easy to have it blown up and then it feels like you have no place to land. Think back of, to something you probably read in your history books when you were in school about how the church vehemently went after those early astronomers and killed many of them for daring to say that the earth was not at the center of the universe. Because it, in their minds that if the earth wasn't at the center of all of creation, then God wasn't at all at the center of creation. And the Bible was wrong, and God can't be wrong. So let's kill the people who don't agree with us. It took a long time and many lives lost before people could see the complexity of creation being different than what they had previously been taught or believed. And that that did not diminish God's power or providence. God no more solely resided in a temple any more than God solely resides in a molten rock, one of many in creation. If that were the case, then your God is much too small for the complexities of life. Peter has the same struggle as he listens to Jesus tell about his upcoming suffering and death and betrayal. Peter's kind of gotten in line with Jesus' healing and teaching, but he can't understand what being tortured and killed, how it even fits into what Jesus talks about. Matter of fact, he's going to make sure that it doesn't happen. When you hear a person you're following start talking nonsense or acting crazy, if you care about them and the cause, you try and talk some sense into them and turn them around before it gets too late. And that's what Peter tries to do for Jesus. The problem is, is that Peter doesn't fully understand the complexities of what it means to really call Jesus the Messiah, the son of the living God, as he's just confessed Jesus is. Peter's picture of Messiah was way too small to be contained in Jesus' words. Jesus' kingdom and his actions were far bigger than what Peter could imagine. Now you may not be all that ready to sign up for your own simplicity versus complexity retreat with Jesus. It may even frighten you a little bit to think that God might be asking you to examine some of your closely held faith convictions and to be at least willing to entertain a different perspective on things. The outrage we hear around us when this is asked would make those complaining Israelites look like child's play. We are so much better than them ever when it comes to complaining and inflicting our venom and acting badly around one another. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't shy away from such invitations from God to grow in ways we maybe never had thought about. A while back, our men's breakfast group read together, at least part of, a book by Brian McLaren entitled, Faith After Doubt, why your beliefs stopped working, and what to do about it. And while the book didn't quite jive with us, one of the images that I have held from reading the book that helps me think about what's happening with Peter and those wilderness wanderers comes from his thing about trees. And maybe it'll help you a little bit too. In that book, McLaren uses the image of tree rings to describe our stages of faith. With kind of those inmost rings representing stage one, 
and the Alworth growth representing subsequent stages. Each new stage builds on the one before it, which means even if you feel like you're losing your faith, you are still holding on to the gifts you've gained from the earlier stages. Like a tree, the dark rings represent dormant seasons, fall and winter. And the wider areas in between represent growth, the seasons of summer and spring. And you need both sets of rings in order for a tree to be strong. Because if the tree only had the rings, the light colored rings of growth, then the tree would be weak and brittle. And if it only had the dark rings of dormancy, the tree would be too dense and have little life within it. Both are necessary for the health of a tree. Maybe it's something to keep in mind as we face challenges and encounter things that maybe butt up against our own beliefs like Peter did that day with Jesus. Now, I can't say I have ever heard God say to me, get behind me, Satan, which I guess I'm happy for, because <laughs> I can't even imagine how Peter must have felt that day. But what I have heard from God are things along the lines of, do you really think that's what I mean by following me? Or where did that come from? And those are the times when I've reflected on what's been going on and have most often seen where I've bought in maybe too far to a political position or it's touched off a personal prejudice or where I've compromised a core belief. Especially that one that tells me I'm a beloved child of God and so is that other person. When I've done that, those are those times when God has become too small for the complexities of life. And I can either complain about it, stomp my feet and rally a bunch of people around me to tell them I'm right and we're going to go force everybody else to believe exactly like I do. Or I can listen to Jesus and follow him. As difficult as that may be. For he promises abundant life. As Dr. Terry Lester points out, Peter's faith journey reminds us that faith doesn't always shield us from hardship. Reflecting on what happened in Peter's life, as well as the challenges of our own faith, and keeping those tree rings in mind, we see that unraveling can lead to profound growth. Like Peter, we may have to face inconvenient truths and drop our preconceived notions. Jesus' response to Peter reminds us of the importance of our commitment to God's mission, to the kingdom Jesus talked about and taught about, even when it's difficult. Sometimes it's by leaning into grief and challenges that we begin the journey of healing in our own lives, and yes, in our relationship to God as well. Grief isn't about fixing what has happened as much as it is to learn new ways to navigate the realities of our life. So we heed Jesus' call to set our mind on things that are above, especially God's grace, and that we trust that we are guided by the unwavering love of our Creator, even in the midst of the unexpectedness of life. And perhaps that's the gift of Peter's encounter with Jesus today. We are given the opportunity to see ourselves and to embrace the transformative nature of faith. We're invited to look upon the one who does indeed undergo great suffering and was killed and was buried, but who was also resurrected from the dead. We're invited to look at that one, lifted up on another tree in a different desert on a hill and live. Live in the freedom and strength that only he can give. When you come to think about it, at least for me, 
that's the Jesus. I want walking with me through the difficult days of this life. And I trust you do too. So come to Jesus today and always and live. I invite you to pray with me. Jesus, Messiah, Lord. We shudder to hear you talk about suffering and debt, death. We can't always keep our minds on divine things or say, no, get behind me, Satan, when temptations or doubts or hardships come. Continue to work in us that we may be changed and grow in our faith. Show us how to be your divine-minded disciples. We pray that you would strengthen us to meet the challenges and complexities of our ever-changing world. Lord, we ask all things that is in accord with your will, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. as you are able and join me as we use the Apostles Creed this day to declare our faith I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ God's only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We turn our hearts now to prayer praying for all according to their need. Gracious God, your love unites. Give vision to the global church and foster cooperation in mission. Increase interreligious understanding and ecumenical dialogue. Help us to stand with and advocate for people caught up in the complexities of life. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Creating God, your love enlivens. Restore balance to the earth's fragile habitats. Preserve wilderness lands, rainforests, and wildlife. 
cleanse oceans and rivers, heal places and people devastated by natural disasters, and empower us to be good stewards of all creation. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Righteous God, your love liberates. We give you thanks for those who courageously witness to your liberating love, especially Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, renewers of society whom we commemorate this day. Free all people from the evils of racism, religious strife, and hatred. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Merciful God, your love heals. Care tenderly for all who are struggling these days, whether that be in mind or body or soul. Strengthen health care workers, first responders, and caregivers. Relieve all who, who live with chronic illness and pain. As we gather this day, we lift in prayer the family and friends of Dolores Smith. We pray for the families, family and friends of Chuck Flieger. We pray for Jan and Sue, for Joyce and Emo, for Sammy and Joe and Rosalie and Dawn, for John and Betty, and all who are on our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Incarnate God, your love enlightens. Open our hearts and minds to fresh understandings of our faith. Deepen our love for you and for one another. Teach us to pray for our enemies. Hear us, O oh God. Abiding God, your love saves. Those who died in faith are made alive in Christ. And we give you thanks for your promise that we also will be raised to newness of life together with them. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those around you in a way you and they are most comfortable. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our offertory. We're hoping this one works. Seems like we're having some embedded music problems today. Thought I'd fix them.
Let us pray together. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this. For the remembrance of me. <coughs> and again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. The things of God for the gathered people of God. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. I invite you to be seated. I um, would once again invite you to come through our center aisle to receive um, the sacrament this day. I will place a wafer in your hand, the body of Christ, and then please proceed to our communion assistant, either this way if you're on this side or this way if you're on that side, and pick up a cup with either wine or grape juice, whichever you are most comfortable with, and then put that cup in the containers at the far end of the pews as you go back to your seats by the side aisles. Our elements are gluten-free if that is of concern to you. This is Christ's table, and God's grace and Christ's love is open to all, just as this table is. He 
stand as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life, amen. amen. Beloved, you are God's own people, holy, washed, and renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. We close singing together day by day.
remember God in every place and in every face. May you find courage to get out of the boat, run to the tomb, and speak of your faith. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. You are called. You are blessed. In both your ups and downs, you always belong to God. Go now in peace, trusting that good news. Thanks be to God. Who else can we recruit? 